welcome to series two, episode one of our brilliant virtual foraging series with me, Vix, from the Family Foraging Kitchen. And this is all thanks to the National Lottery Reaching Communities Fund, who have enabled us to bring this series to you at home to teach you about the sustainable abundance of all we have to offer you on the Rame Peninsula. It is really important that we have a more sustainable diet, that we are looking to our hedgerow and our countryside for ways that we can get nutrition into our diets to support our families. Really important. So today I'm going to take you through five beautiful seasonal wild edibles of October up here at the fabulous Maker Heights. So here we are then with our first wild edible of October. Now I say October, but actually this is a wild edible that we have growing all year around. It just so happens though at this time of year, they all have a new lease of life and are looking really green and vibrant in the hedgerow. So you really want to have this one in all your dishes right now. Our gardens have been put to bed. So we're all now mulching our grounds and waiting for the next flush of spring vegetables to come in. We're looking at our hedgerow for what's wild and what's green. So here we have, common sorrel. Now sorrel is one of my absolutely favourite plants. It's very easy to recognise. It has an arrow shaped top to the leaf and then a little fork which goes back down towards the stem like an old Victorian coat tail or if you turn it the other way around like devil horn. So however you want to remember, I like to think of it as a coat tail. Now um, sorrel has a very sharp lemon flavour. Some people compare it to the skin of a Granny Smith apple. I like to tell kids it's like nature's Haribo sweet. It has a very acidic taste because of the oxalic acid. And they say you shouldn't eat too much, but you would really need to eat a bowl for breakfast, lunch and dinner for it to have any ill effect. Having it in a nice salad with your dinner at this time of year is perfect. My favourite thing to do is to chop an apple, mix it with some walnuts, some sorrel leaves and a little bit of mayonnaise, or put it through a potato salad or put it into, uh, make it into a salsa verde, which is a recipe, not a recipe, sorry, it's a concept. You can use any green leaf to make a green sauce and this makes a really good one. So common sorrel, do eat it all year round, but especially during the autumn and winter months when greens are less common grown in gardens um, all year round. No plastic, no chemicals and completely free. So here we are then, number two on our list this month is the blackthorn. Now blackthorn is a prunus, which is the same family of plants that you have a plum. And when you look at the blackthorn fruits themselves and hold them up, they do actually look like little plums. Now, blackthorn, sloes. These are something that we always associate with Christmas. You buy a bottle of gin or rum and you prick the fruit and you put it in the bottle, add a little bit of sugar, turn it upside down and you have a slow gin. But I think there's much more to a slow than just an alcohol ingredient and I like to make puddings with them. So at the end of this series, we're going to do a little, uh, we're going to do a little cookery program, and we're going to be making a slow tart with dark chocolate and with lots of little edible flowers. And I'm going to teach you how to do that. The other thing I like to do is to make them into chutneys and to jams. They are full of vitamin C. They are beautiful, and they are a natural free delight at this time of year in October. So they are our slows growing on the blackthorn. So here we are, number three is one of my favourite autumnal trees. This is the majestic hawthorn tree. Now when you look at hawthorn and you see these berries, a lot of people think actually that they're not edible and yet they are. They are a gorgeous ingredient if you're making things like ketchups or stews or chutneys. And one of my favourite recipes at this time of year is a spicy ginger beetroot and hawthorn soup. And if you're lucky enough to be in receipt of one of our wild food boxes this month, that recipe is in the box. So it's, it's a beautiful thing. It's associated with the heart. They used to say that if someone was grieving or mourning or suffering with a broken heart that they would be given a tincture of hawthorn to help cure them. They have these gorgeous bright berries, they're really cheerful. Be careful when you're picking hawthorn, they're incredibly sharp, they have these really little vicious thorns and if you get them in your finger they're incredibly difficult to get out. So be careful when you pick them, cut them away from their little branchy like stems and then you're going to want to boil them up in a saucepan and run them through a sieve. The reason being is inside our hawthorn berries is a tiny little stone which is full of cyanide, the same thing you get in apple pips and that's something you don't want to eat. So you're boiling them and then you're catching that pulp and then you're using that as a lovely ingredient in your kitchen, a warming one this autumn. So that is Hawthorne. 
So number four is a beautiful autumn ingredient. It takes us right the way through the winter. It's one of our staple winter greens and it is the lovely Alexanders. Now Alexanders is something we talked about in series one, but we have to think about them all year round because every part of the plant is edible. And at this time of year, they are our poor man's asparagus. We are eating them in their young, fresh stemmed state. So let me just come down here into the bush, following the plant with my finger all the way down to the base of the stem and I'll hold it to camera so you can see. Now it looks a little bit like a celery or a parsley and actually it was more in favour until the early 19th century until we started growing those things and putting them into shops. This was brought here by the Romans to be eaten in a similar way. The young stalks here we can use like an asparagus spear. If you cut them and you fry them in butter or oil they have that beautiful arom aromatic asparagusy flavour. The leaves you can put straight into a salad bowl, they're extremely delicious. And then on the end of here you have a taproot, which is almost like a parsnip, um, but it tastes very much like an Alexander. So if you've never tried them before, you have to really give them a go. But be careful with this family of plant. This is in the Umbellifer family, the Umbellifers, two of which, the hemlocks, are fatal and can kill you. So you must make sure you have identified this correctly. If in doubt, leave it out. And that's when I advise you to always come on a foraging walk with me, do those walks all year round and get to know this family of plants really well. But this is in your box this month. It's one of our fabulous ingredients, Alexander's, and we are going to be using them with all kinds of dishes this month. Um, steamed, fried, boiled, chopped. I really like mine fried on the side with mashed potatoes and some sausages. However you like to eat them, go for it. But the beautiful, gorgeous green October vegetable that are Alexander's. The final one in this episode is going to be something that I get really excited about at this time of year. And that's because I've not seen it for a couple of months. It's been gone and now it is back for its second flush, its second season. And that is the wonderful Umbelica, otherwise known as Pennywort or Navelwort. Now it's known as Pennywort or Navelwort because it is said to look like your tummy button, hence its Latin name Umbelica. And this has got a really subtle flavour like a monge too or a bitter pea and it's a wonderful ingredient to chuck last minute at the end of a stir fry um, or just to have through a salad actually. I really like to put cheese on it and balsamic glaze um, or I just like to munch them as I'm walking around the hedge. They're full of water so they help to quench your thirst if you're thirsty but lots of people say to me at this time of year there's not enough green things to eat in the head surely foragers just do, don't do anything in the autumn in the winter or well, not true now is the time for your fresh young greens to be popping back through and with this is one of my favorite examples so pennywort nothing you can see that would confuse it with anything poisonous go out there and look for your little magic tummy buttons So here we are then back at the Family Foraging Kitchen HQ where we take you through the cookery element of our show and we are going to be making a slow and dark chocolate tort um, with some lovely different kinds of chocolates and some edible wild flowers. So how do we cook a slow into something that you don't just put into gin and drink as alcohol as lovely as that is? Get your slows, here's some we foraged earlier and you want to put them into a saucepan. Now, I've put some in there already to get it going before we started filming. I'm going to pop in a few more just so you can see what I'm doing. Don't worry that they've got the stones in at this point. That is totally fine. So there they are coming to the boil in our pan. You will need a sieve. <clears throat> now, you want a sieve that's very strong and with a very fine mesh because what you don't want to get into your tarts are the, um, the stones that are inside the slows. You need to keep all of those in the top so you're just getting this really lovely juicy pulp at the bottom. Now, I like to normally use a large pastry case, uh, but today I didn't have time to make one and they didn't have any in the shops. So I found these beautiful little pre-made volivon cases. So I thought, why not try to put them in there? So I'm going to show you what to do. These slows are now starting to come up to the boil with the hot water, which is fantastic. And now I'm going to take this little pot, put my sieve on it very, very carefully. Give these a crush with a wooden spoon. Yes, they're starting to get nice. So I'm gonna take those off the heat and pop these 
into the sieve. Now what you don't want to do is completely obliterate them, but you want to make them soft enough so that they will come through. There we are, see they're popping. That's a lovely little, lovely squelch that you can hear. Just catching that lovely colorful pulp through the sieve. Keep pushing, keep going. If you feel like it's tough work, it is, but it's worth every minute of it. All right, so then using the back of the spoon, catching that pulp, you see? There we go, that's going in there. Don't worry that your pan's still on the heat, you're gonna be putting this mixture back in there in a minute. Keep going, keep working. Now the stones won't do you any harm if you swallow them, but you will find they'll go straight through you. And unless you like that sensation, I don't advise it. So there we go, sticky jam, give it a couple more turns. Oh, if you've got kitchen help, you could always make someone else do this for you while you sat and boss them around. And just do the fun bit. Some more pulp, lovely. Right, now pop that on there for just a second. Pop this back into the pan. And then you want to add your sugar. A good jam needs a good sugar. Now slows, when you eat them straight off the bush, you'll notice they're extremely tart and they make you go like that with your lips. So you need to add a good amount of sugar. So do not be horrified parents at the amount of sugar going in here, but it needs a lot to make a jam. I say parents, basically this is a very, very sexy decadent pud. You probably find that you scoff it before the kids get home from school. So keep going, turn that round. Now you want to bring that up to a rolling jam boil. If you have a thermometer at home, a jam thermometer, that's the best way to do it. However, if you don't have one, don't panic. You can use the back of a spoon. And I will show you how to do that in a minute because I do not have a jam thermometer here. Once the jam is ready, it will coat the back of the spoon without sliding off and then you know that it will give you a good set because that's what we're looking for. A set jam in the bottom of the volivon, which will then be topped by the next ingredient. So whilst that comes back up to a nice bubbly boil and never walk away from your jam pot when you're cooking jam because what will happen is you'll take your eye off the ball, it will be a volcano and you'll get horribly burnt. You do not want that to happen. So make sure you have your eye on it. Right, you need to create a bain-marie. Here is my, now I have been making, pre-making these before we were filming. So I have some chocolate already um, that was melted and then it's reset in the bowl. So I'm just going to take my spoon out of there. I'm gonna get my hot water. And I'm gonna pour that boiling hot water from the kettle in the pot, keeping one eye on the jam at all times. Put that in there. So I want to melt that chocolate. Now I'm gonna add a little bit more. I like to use a variety of chocolates, not any of my chocoholic, but it just makes it look pretty. So this is a, a milk chocolate, an organic milk chocolate. A few squares of that. White chocolate, sorry. And this is a milk chocolate, organic milk chocolate. You could use anything you like. You could use a caramel bar, you could use 70% oh, a, a dark chocolate. But remember that the slows are a very sophisticated dark taste anyway. So I think a lighter chocolate actually tastes nicer. Bubble, bubble, that's going. This has to melt. Okay. Now make sure you've got your volivon cases or your pastry case to hand. So you're gonna need a steady hand in a minute. And you're going to need a jug. The jug just makes it easier to pour the hot jam into the cases in a minute. So, so using a clean spoon, let's see. So it's not quite there yet. So when I'm taking the spoon out of the pan, it's just running straight off the spoon. What we're looking for is it to coat the spoon. So that needs a few more minutes. That's good. Let's put our chocolate on here. Speed that up a little bit. Keep checking, it's almost there. It's becoming slightly darker on the spoon, but not quite. Right, we have a coat. We have a coat on the back of the spoon. So I'm gonna turn that one off. So we just want that second one on there. Be very careful if you haven't got a pan handle. Tea towel. Hot jam. Oh, hot jam. <laughs> 
could be a name of a bat. Right, let's put that there. Now, very carefully, with a steady hand, you want to fill your little cases. Whoa, not like that. <laughs> Don't do that. Right, let's see if I can do that one a bit better. Hey, that one's a bit better. Okay. jam actually sets pretty quickly but what I would suggest if you're not doing it quick to a camera and you have plenty of time in your kitchen is if you pop these into the fridge now for about five minutes the jam will set firmly and you'll find it much easier to do the next part of the procedure just enough just enough to do them all look at that perfect who would have thought who would have thunk it right okay Chocolate, chocolate. Oh yeah, that's becoming, oh, this is my favorite part. It's my absolute favorite part. I don't know if you ever remember cooking with parents when you were young and you used to get given the spoon to lick. That was always the best part and still is. Right, okay. Oh. So we're gonna take this very carefully off, making sure we remember to turn the oven off. So we don't cause a fire. Bing! Right, and that will still melt because that's still over the hot water. So that will still be melting as I am spooning onto my lovely jammy tarts. Right, okay. So, look at that. Oh, I just love melted chocolate so much. It's delicious. Pour that on top of your lovely jamminess. Now, how much do you put on? It's up to you. If you're a big fan of the chalk, like I am, get as much in there as possible, as much as you can fit. If you prefer more of a jam, obviously less. Some people think less is more. I think more is the best. So, there we go. Oh, yum. And that, essentially, is what you do. You want to do that on every single one until Blue Peter style. Let me just do that one because I've started, so I'll finish. Plop. Oh, look at that. Oh, look at that. It's like a little beautiful swollen mound of joy. Here are some that I made earlier. So there you are. So once the chocolate has melted or started to melt, then you can get creative with some edible decorations. So I decided to choose some corn flowers. Corn flowers are a lovely edible flower. And uh, although we are in October, if you planted your seeds late, your wildflower seeds late, you will still have some. These are actually from the hedgerow up at Maker. So if you're up here wandering around, do spot the cornflowers in the banks, put one of those on. And then I like to put gorse flowers. Gorse flowers are the emblem of happiness and they are a natural antidepressant and they are beautiful and coconutty in flavour and just give us that gorgeous contrast to the colours that we've got on the plate. But you could put anything on, you know, you could put rose petals, you could put a bit of desiccated coconut, you could put, I don't know, whatever you fancy, a nut whatever you want to do. And then I've got this lovely, lovely pink Achillea, a member of the Yarrow family. This is just a little, little pink splodge. Make it look pretty. And there we have your delectable, delicious little slow jam and dark and milk chocolate volivant tarts. And the best thing to do then is just to 